Hey guys, welcome to Irish Medieval History and this week I want to look at the link between Kiev, Ireland and the wider world in the Viking Age and I'm going to have to start at the very very basics. Of course you guys who have subscribed to the channel probably already know the opening information and that is the link between Ireland and Norway at the start of the Viking Age and then I want to advance further up covering the history, a bit of the history, a slight bit of the history because now going out of my comfort zone of Ireland but then going over to the lights of Novgorod, look I already pinned it down before, and Kiev right here. So ultimately what I want to do at the end of it is explain what the link is between Ireland, Kiev here and the wider world going as far as Japan and Newfoundland, America, and how this is all linked. Is that Newfoundland? I don't know, lucky for me, I did my research before I started doing all this, and it's here. So I think I was correct. <laughs> so, that's basically what I wanna to cover today. So, we have to go back to the very, very start of this, the very start of the Viking Age in Ireland. And the very start of the Viking Age in Ireland, and in Britain, starts in 793 with the old attack in Linder's farm. Now, it's still debated in Ireland where the Viking Age starts and where the Viking Age ends, but I'm, I'm gonna tell you right here, it starts in 793 because that's when we start to get raids. That's the earliest raid between Britain and Ireland, and they all start emerging from here, okay? So they all come from this point in Norway. This is where the majority of these attacks in Linder's farm, Scotland, and in Ireland. Now, at the same time, we also start getting emergence here. This is kind of what the Brit Britain, England, or the Anglo-Saxons brand as the Danish, okay? So at the time, there isn't any country per se. Now, a lot of people, they think Danish Vikings, or the Danish, they think of Denmark. But technically speaking, at the time, it was kind of this rough area here, okay? So that whole area of Sweden, Denmark, and Norway is kind of put under Danish because it's kind of that blurry, because there's no country, there's no defining line, okay? So that whole area is put as Danish. So anytime you hear Danish Vikings, it's kind of that blurry line here because there's no defining country. Now, over time, it, it, Denmark, Danish, is kind of defined as Denmark right here, okay? But for now, it's kind of that blurry line here. And then the Norse or Northmen, the annals of Ulster literally call them Northmen. So what they're calling Northmen, they're literally referring to these people here, okay? So these people start to come over here and the Northmen come over and they occupy these areas here, here, and then here, okay? And they get to, they're then referred to, so from here, 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 and here, they're referred to as the Kingdom of Lucklin. And they start up their own hybrid kingdom between Gaelic and Norse. And they become, some people call them the Norse Gaels. Um, in the annals themselves, they're referred to as Gaul Gael, okay? And then eventually, the people who are living here, between these islands here, here, they become the Galloglass. So they become, in the late medieval period, they become uh, mercenaries between Scotland and Ireland who are hired by various people for various battles and skirmishes and so on and so forth, okay? So later on, they're called the Galloglass, but for the time being, in the annals themselves, they're called the Gaul Gael. And a lot of people call them the Norse Gaels, but that term is funny because you also have Danish that come in and start to mix, and that's where the term Hiberno-Scandinavian comes in, and it's, it's still all debated today. Regardless, let's push on. So we have the Kingdom of Lucklin. Kingdom of Lucklin pushes down, and then we have a subgroup of Ire of the Bonus who occupy the Isle of Man and Dublin, and they get to be known as the official Hiberno Scandinavians. So there's no debate there, right? So in 850, they come over, uh, Ivor the Bonus comes over, he occupies the Isle of Man, Dublin. There's still debate, did Ivor the Bonus originate from the Kingdom of Lucklin, or did he come out of the Danish Vikings? We don't know, there's a lot of debates on that. Um, and that's why kind of what I want to cover because a lot of historians right now are heavily debating the origins of Ivor the Bonus because if we can find the origins of Ivor the Bonus, perhaps we can find out what the ultimate link is between Dublin at the time and Ireland in general and the wider world and which is connected then to Denmark and the Danish Vikings and then over to Kiev, which I'm 
in the middle of explaining right here. So we're now as far as Dublin and we're trying to, this is where historians are trying to work out how is Ivor the Bonus linked to the wider world? Because originally we had the Norse Vikings, they started to come in and they now occupy this area and this area. They started to have children amongst the Scottish, well, the Pictish and the Scots at the time. And now they're referred to as the Gaul Gael as they move in. And also the Northmen because you still have Norsemen coming over and settling in these various areas. So you have a mixture now of Northmen and Gaul Gael mixing in. And exactly when Ivor the Bonus comes in, although in the annals themselves he's referred to as part of the Kingdom of Lucklin, which makes it more confusing because at the same time you have a connection between Denmark and Ivor the Bonus that comes in. And that's why it's heavily debated is Ivor the Bonus from Norway. And when I say Norway, I mean this part of Norway, or is he from the Danish, okay? So Ivor the Bonus comes in, and exactly when he comes in, we have Danish mercenaries are talked about, Danish Vikings start to appear in the annals. You now have two factions inside Dublin itself, the Fingal and Dovgal, and people are debating, does Fingal and Dovgal mean uh, new foreigners or old foreigners? Does it mean Danish Vikings, Norse Vikings? There's a lot of debates, and it's so it's actually really awesome. It's really, really awesome debates. Um, there's three major books that are covering this. One is Viking Kings of Britain and Ireland. The follow-up to that was Norse Gaelic Contacts of the Viking World. And there is a third one, which we'll also post up that I'm actually in the middle of reading right now. So it's all interesting debate, right? And so Ivor the Bonus pops in, and it's at that point we start to get Danish influence in Ireland, and we refer to this as the Hiberno-Scandinavians. So there's no ifs or buts. We don't know, is there Danish Vikings beforehand? Because the annals do speak of Danish Vikings appearing in Cork and uh, Waterford area before that. So it's very confusing, okay? But regardless, what we do is we start to get a link here, but you can see what the problem is straight away between Denmark and Dublin. There's something in the way. Something is seriously in the way. And in the Viking sagas, I have the, prob I have the problem, I was gonna say I have the bonus, has a problem with England. In particular, the kingdom of Northumbriel, well, well, will be the kingdom of England. At the time now, it's kingdom of Northumbriel, East Anglia, uh, Mercia and Wessex, okay? And somehow Ivor the Bonus manages to raise a large army from the Norse, from the Danish Vikings, from the Gaul Gael, and he raises them all and he brings them over to York. And we have York right here. There it is right there. And what he wants to do ultimately and we have a lot more at this period as well we have tons of battles in chester especially later on and around um 915 to 950 we have a lot of battles around chester and york right there and the reason for these battles is to connect dublin to denmark ultimately because you can see that route bang on look there's the there's chester right there and then there's york and that's the ultimate goal and we have that with the great heathen armies invasion of England from 865 to 878. That's when we see the Great Hayden Army coming in and going through. And at the same time, we have Swedish uh, Vikings known as the Rus. They start, well, they're invited in. That's debated on itself now. They're invited in to Novgorod here to rule over the Slavic, supposedly. But that's all debated, and that's out of my field of expertise, okay? And if you feel I'm getting anything wrong, like even the bloody location, <laughs> please tell me uh, right away, because this is completely, what I'm talking about now is stuff that I've researched independently away from uh, professionals, okay? So I've now gone into, and because I'm honest about it compared to a lot of YouTubers who get information wrong all the time, who are not corrected, um, they continue giving out misinformation. So I'm telling you here, what, I, what I'm telling you now is stuff that I've gone off and independently researched myself with no uh, backing whatsoever. So if I have misinformation, please not only correct me, but give me the correct source because there's no point giving me, uh, saying, oh, that's wrong. You need to give me the correct information so I can correct my own information because this is so important. What I'm telling you now is so, so important to our own history and lineage because 
I, what I've told you now connects us to the wider world, okay? So at the same time, in around, in the fifth century, we have Kiev. Kiev is starting to settle, right? So Kiev now is born in the fifth century. So that's the same time Ireland sets going into the golden age. We also have the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. Uh, Rome pulls out Britain in about 410. Um, so that's kind of, some people brand as the Dark Ages, okay? It's also called the Late Antiquity. And if you're in Ireland, that's the Golden Age. Ireland goes into a Golden Age of saints and scholars. So that same time, Kiev is also born, okay? And what Kiev is, is a center trading point down to what at the time is Constantinople, today Istanbul. So that is born in the 5th century. So straight away, in about um, 838, we have Swedish diplomats making their way uh, from various tribes, making their way down uh, from here, do, 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 do. oh yeah, from here, making their way down to Kiev, and then from Kiev, making their way down to Istanbul. Now Kiev is not, that's under Slavic control at the time, that is not yet, actually no, it's not under Slavic control per se, the Slavic people living there, but a lot of people are contesting uh, a lot of different kingdoms and tribes are contesting and are constantly fighting over Kiev, which is right here, okay? So Kiev is very important, as we know today. Um, very, very important. Really important trading hub. And right there, because there's so much culture coming in there, um, you can see that Kiev is very diverse. It is so important. So many different cultures are influencing and Kiev itself is influencing many other cultures around it as well. So Kiev has a lot of very interesting history right there. So at the time, diplomats are making their way down and that becomes vitally important, this whole area here. So then in um, 858, the Norse, um, from my um, sources that I was going through and I found, and if you want to give me more sources to correct me, please do so because... To be honest with you, I think the Rus would have came in much more earlier than um, 858, but 858 is the earliest one I could find when I was doing research into this, that the Rus from Sweden, so the, the Rus are Swedish Vikings, started to make their way down raiding and trading, okay? So then, in about um, 859, you can see me looking at my cheat sheet here, <laughs> in about 859, the Rus occupy and they take over while well, they're invited, allegedly, into Novgrad. So the Novgrad Rus or the Rus Novgrad start, okay? And that's their main capital there, right? And there's constant fighting and la 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 around there, right? Now, it has to be highlighted to take this, because this river is going down here, or a river. You can see bits of it bobs here. But they need to occupy and then push their way down to Kiev because they want to take full control of this area here to then go down and open up basically full control, full monopoly of trade down to Constantinople. That's their ultimate goal, right? And why is this? Why do they want to do that? It's because they want to connect themselves to the Silk Road. So that keep that in mind. That's so important because the trade into the Silk Road network, you can see that straight away. The moment you hit that, boom, you're literally linked all the way over to Japan. And you want to hit that China is the most important. China is the most important because from China then they can hit the bigger, wider world around them. Look at that, into the Indian market, do you know? So I think Okinawa there is actually where I live right now. There's Naha. Um, we actually have Roman coins. So, and we have coins from the Byzantine Empire. So we know that from here, they were trading as far as here and into Japan because we have Roman coins in Okinawa and Japan, okay? So that's vitally important, it's really important information. So then, the Great Heat Army occupies, and because the Great Heat Army was successful in taking York, um, Ivan the Bonus gives back, he dies, Dan E. Ever takes over, um, there's continuous fighting here, but then finally, in about 919, um, between the Battle of Isle Bridge and the Siege in York, the Irish Vikings, the Gaul Gael, finally have full dominance of the trade in this area, okay? They may not have full control of Scotland, the actual land itself, or full control over uh, Wessex, 
but they do have full control of the whole trade going around here, okay? Which is the Insular Scandinavian Trade Network, okay? And from there, um, they're able to push in about 1,000, they're able to push into Iceland. That's not the Gaul Gale, by the way, the Norse are able to push over to Iceland, still allied to the Norse and the Danish Vikings. They're able to push into Iceland, Greenland, and then over to Newfoundland, which is here. And then supposedly, according to the sagas, they even went as far as New York, but we can never find solid evidence for that. The reason for that is because New York is covered in concrete. So we're never gonna find solid evidence of that. But we do find in Dublin is silk um, headdresses and the silk headdresses when sourced come from China, right? Which is still more proof. And we can find in recent archeology span finds in Cork, we have found belt buckles from Novgrad as well, okay? So that's really, really awesome. It's really interesting. So that's pretty much the link. And that's why the link between Dublin that we have here, or even Dublin, Waterford, Cork, uh, Galway gets built much more later on outside of the um, early medieval period. So it's mostly Limerick, Cork, uh, Waterford, Dublin, because Cork as well is vitally important because eventually, around um, the, the Normans, when the Normans occupy this area region here, they're able to bring wine over, so we start to have wine here. Um, yeah, <laughs> it really goes to show why that's so important into the wider world. So imagine that, that's even bigger. We can't even fit, can we fit all this in? There we go, no, we can't really, can we, sort of. So anyway, regardless, we can literally trade from here all the way, connect to Denmark, then into Novgorod about there, there, then into Kiev about here, and then links here, and then into Istanbul, and then today uh, Constantinople back in the day, and then the moment it hits that, right into the Silk Road, connected right, that's the Silk Road right there. And so what you have is a ton of fighting in this whole region. So then in 920, we start to really dominate that. That's really dominated between us. When we move into, we, we continue fighting uh, on and off. We also have later battles on and off. England takes it, unifies it, then we take it back. Eventually, um, Eric Bloodaxe moves in. He occupies York for a small bit. The Gaul Gale take it back, but they're too weakened. And eventually England occupies it all by 980. Um, by 950. Let me check that. By 954, we then lose it all. So then by 954, we lose our link. Denmark gets annoyed, so they come over in 980, reoccupy this, and relink themselves to Dublin. And then, what else do we start to do? We start to lose more battles. Uh, Mayor Shocknell comes over, he takes Dublin, he takes full control of the link between Dublin and York. And But however, the control that the Eever had, once we lose the Battle of Tara in 980, the control that the Irish Vikings had isn't as strong as it used to be. And you can literally see that with the coinage. The coinage starts off very strong in about 1014, but then afterwards it starts to deplete, it starts to get worse and worse and worse. And that's because the trade network, the control that the Dublin had with York, once the English take control of that, isn't as strong. And Denmark and England continue fighting between mainly pushing to have control of York and London to continue connecting that with Denmark and onto the wider world. However, um, once England properly takes it, and then afterwards we have, funny enough, uh, Vikings who originally were here and were part of the wine trade into the likes of London, York and Cork, they completely turn tails, become extremely faithful to the Pope, and then they come over and invade England and connect England into the European trade network rather than the Scandinavian and Silk Road tra uh, trade network. So eventually that just all dies off, sadly. And once the Mongolians invade much more later on, about 
but the late 13th century Kiev gets taken over by the Mongolians and that's really the golden age completely utterly finished so for us um, 980 is pretty much the end of the Viking Age for us because we're no longer at their peak anymore of this whole trade network that we were once a part of and that's why a lot of people they might say a lot of people do argue with me they're like oh but Viking raids continue after 980 and 1014 but what you see is in 980 um, at the Battle of Tara is once Mael Shockno the Gaelic take over Dublin it's kind of the end of the Irish Vikings having complete control of that, the Gaul Gael. And then in 1014, that's kind of our, the Gaul Gael's last kind of push to take Dublin and then push it back into the strong link it once had. But it loses the Battle of, um, it doesn't lose the Battle of Clontarf, but in the Battle of Clontarf, it doesn't take enough strength to become as dominant as it once did. It becomes too depleted um, to push on to York like it once did you know so that's pretty much between the Battle of Tara and the Battle of Clontarf that's pretty much the end of it because at the Battle of Clontarf both sides both the um, Brian Bruce side who's also made up of Irish Vikings the Gaul Gael and uh, the Gaelic and so is the Kingdom of Dublin at the time Citric side who made up of Gaelic and Gaul Gael but the thing is, is that Dublin and the King of Ireland are so depleted after the battle that there really is no winner at the end. And so the Kingdom of Dublin is no longer able to dominate the Irish Sea like they once did. And although they do try to reorganise themselves many times, they never hit the peak of the Viking Age at the end of 1014. So 1014, that's kind of the end of the Viking Age in Ireland. And then in 1066, that becomes the end of of the Viking Age in England. You will no longer see England being connected to the um, larger Viking world. So although a lot of people debate of when the Viking Age ends, that's kind of, 1066 is the end of the Viking Age. You know, no matter how many people say, oh, you know, there's um, reasons why they're trying to mark 1066. Look, 1066, we're no longer connected the way they were. We're now more connected to Europe and Christianity and the Catholic Church and stuff than we were with the Scandinavian and the Silk Road and so on and so forth. So sadly, that's the end. And that's how Ireland is connected to Kiev and the wider world. And what is the end of the Viking Age, <laughs> sadly? So other than that, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hey guys, thank you so, so much for listening to my waffle. If you want to listen to more of it, on the 15th of May, myself and Maniacal are doing a live Q&A on 11th century Ireland, and we're also playing some Crusader Kings Tree as well, set obviously in 11th century Ireland. The times are right in front of you. Also, if you want to buy some merch and support the channel, that would be much appreciated. Other than that, guys, thank you so, so much, and all the best.